The characters in the birth narrative of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke include some amazing and surprising people, such as a young teenage woman, shepherds, and an army of heavenly singers. The angels are the first beings to proclaim the historically significant birth of Jesus. So who are they? What was their role? And what was the actual message they brought? The text in Luke chapter 2, 8 through 12 reads, An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. The announcement of the birth of Christ is first brought to a group of shepherds by one angel who is then joined by a host of angels. The first angel is surrounded by glory. The sudden brightness in the middle of the nighttime darkness adds intensity and authority to the scene. Angels were messengers, envoys, ones sent by God. The word might have originated from the concept of bringing tidings. They were spiritual beings created by God to execute his purposes, to make known his plans. They are spirits who do not necessarily have material bodies as people do. They're either in human form or can assume human form when necessary. The appearances of these angelic beings, these messengers of God to people and their subsequent fear were common occurrences in the Old Testament. They happened when God was intervening in history in supernatural ways, in special circumstances. Visitations from angels or from the Lord to announce that there would be a birth and a required naming occurred before other major births in the Old Testament. In Genesis 16, an angel appears to Hagar and announces that she will have a son and will name him Ishmael. The very next chapter in Genesis 17, the text says that the Lord appeared to Abram and announces to him that he and his wife will have a son and name him Isaac. In Isaiah 7, the Lord gives a sign through Isaiah that a young woman would give birth to a son and he would be called Emmanuel. And in Luke, we have both Zachariah and Mary being visited by an angel who announces the coming birth, including the child's name. The visitation narrative with the angels in chapter two of Luke follows a pattern from two previous visitations in Luke, an appearance, fear, reassurance not to be afraid, and then a promise of a sign. The sign to the shepherds is the baby in a manger. Now fear was a frequent response to these visitations and the angel's exhortation to be not afraid or do not fear was common in Old Testament experiences as well. In the Gideon narrative in Judges 6, an angel of the Lord appears to Gideon and when he realizes it is an angel, he cries out and the Lord says to him, peace do not be afraid. Earlier in Jesus' birth story in Luke, we see two examples of this. Zechariah being visited by the angel in the temple where he is startled and gripped with fear. And when the angel visits Mary, the angel begins with, do not be afraid. The reaction to an unexpected presence of a messenger of God seems to be fear, which is understandable. There's a sudden intrusion into one's daily routine of a power that is outside one's experience. It is an existential moment where the reality that the heavenly realm is active and powerful becomes real. When we are confronted with the reality of God's presence and activity, our response is often one of awe, fear, and trembling. However, it is not the surprising, awe-inspiring presence of an envoy of God in the middle of the night that is the central point of this passage. It is the message itself that is key. The message that the angel brings includes three elements and three titles. The elements of the message are that there is good news, great joy, and it is for all the people. The word for good news is used in Isaiah in connection with the good news of God's salvation. It was also used culturally at the time of Jesus to describe celebrations that occurred in the Roman Empire, particularly for the emperor's birthday. In Luke, the angel's announcement of the birth of Christ would have explicitly confronted the practice of celebrating the emperor by taking the language of good news and applying it to a baby 
born in a manger. This baby was the true king, the true Messiah. The news of great joy that would be for all the people is a message that God wants all people to hear and embrace. Every person would be impacted by this historic event. It's not only a cognitive message of knowledge, but an event that necessarily prompts deep and intense joy. It is not merely a truth statement, but an event that will change the nature of everything. The good news that the angels declare will bring abiding joy. In contrast to the ritual of celebration, the empire, that would require obligatory demonstrations of happiness and devotion. The third element of the message the angels bring is that the good news that elicits great joy is for all people, not just for those with the right citizenship or lineage, not just for those with earthly power and authority, not just for the socially accepted, the educated, or the wealthy, but good news for all people. It foreshadows the movement of the gospel from the Jewish world to the Gentile world. It continues the movement in scripture of God's mission that is ever expanding, that crosses all barriers and reaches all corners of the world. The angels then reveal the source of this message by tying together three titles that each have rich meaning. The term savior references God's promise to rescue his people and has a deep meaning in the Old Testament of divine deliverance, of liberation and restoration. To savior, the angels add the title Messiah. This is the Hebrew term that is used less often but means the anointed one. The one who will deliver, rescue and save is the one who has been appointed for this very task. The people of God would have known this term and would have longed for this anointed one to come. Lord, the third title, is a title of authority and power, and the rest of Luke's gospel will unpack what Jesus as Lord means for his people. The Roman emperor was often hailed as Savior and Lord. He claimed this title, and the angel's use of Savior and Lord, tied to the identity of the Messiah, was a powerful confrontation of the emperor. The emperor, the worldly authority, was not a savior, was not the one appointed to bring deliverance. He was not Lord, but Jesus, the one about whom the angels sang, was and is. The combination of the three elements and the three titles is a powerful statement of the historical significance of this moment. It is a glorious announcement of an event that will change all of history, is available for all people and will bring joy. And this event is made possible through the one who has been anointed for this very purpose, the one who will deliver God's people and exercise his power and authority over the kingdoms and leaders of this world, over sin and death. And it is almost as if the heavens cannot contain the joy and glory that accompanies this single angel's words, because at that moment, the angel is joined by a multitude of hosts of heavenly beings, a choir. Luke records it this way in verses 13 and 14. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. The Greek here can be interpreted as host or army. So this magnificent army of angelic beings adds a song, a musical declaration to the message that the initial herald brought. The choir of angels contrasts the Roman Empire and the worship of the emperor as Lord and Savior, where earthly choirs were used in the worship of the emperor. Here, the true king, the true savior, is announced through angelic, supernatural song and music. The peace that Christ brings would have also directly challenged the claim of the Roman Empire, that they had established peace on earth. The emperor at the time, Augustus, was praised for having initiated worldwide peace. He even took the title Divi Filius, which meant son of a God or son of the divine. But Augustus forced peace. It was a peace that was brought through control, oppression, and violence. It was not the kind of peace the angels were describing. The use of peace in Luke 2.14 in the mouths of the angels is connected to messianic salvation. 
The Greek word for peace, Irene, describes harmonious relationships between people, between nations, freedom, order, harmony between God and people, rest and contentment. The corresponding Hebrew term shalom means wholeness. This wholeness will not be ultimately fulfilled until the new heavens and the new earth, but the Messiah will inaugurate a kingdom of this kind of peace. The peace the host sings about is a peace for those on whom the favor of God rests. The phrase on whom his favor rests is a description of God extending his favor to those who do not deserve it. It is used in the Old Testament for those who were part of God's people. This peace of God graciously extending his favor, this favor is available for all people if they respond to it. The glory of God and his reign of peace is all encompassing. It stretches from the highest heaven, the realm where God dwells with heavenly beings to the earth and all those on earth. What does this message of good news, great joy and peace mean to us today? In a world that likes to draw boundaries, to exclude, to label and divide, the angel's announcement that the good news is for all people reminds us of the deep love of God for everyone. The peace that Christ inaugurates in his kingdom is for all people, and God's heart is that all people would know him and know his peace. There is no one, no group, no nationality, no culture that is outside God's love. There is no one for whom the birth of Christ, the Savior, Messiah, and Lord is not good news. And just as the angels proclaimed a message that would elicit great joy, we are invited into that same work to joyously proclaim the saving work of Christ who brings peace.